Stay with us for a special program on the church in China. As we look at religious freedom in China. And visit large city churches and small village meeting points. And witness the printing of Bibles in a new plant in Nanjing. All this and more on Catch the Spirit. Hello, I'm Hilly Hicks. And I'm Emily Seimer. A Catch the Spirit team recently went to China to report on the re-emergence of the church there. Hilly has our first report on that diverse and fascinating country. The Great Wall of China. Initial construction began more than 2,000 years ago to keep invading armies out of China. Today it stands as one of the greatest tourist attractions in the world, welcoming people of many lands into China. It is ironic, therefore, that this great wall, which was built to exclude people, is today perhaps China's greatest symbol of openness to the world. China is a land of antiquity. Temples and shrines and other buildings that date back many centuries can be seen everywhere. The culture and traditions are rich. 85% of the country is rural, and many old ways of living and working are still in use. But alongside the old and traditional is the new and the modern, for China is also urban and increasingly commercial. Its population is the largest on Earth. One out of every four humans, in fact, is Chinese. 1.2 billion people. The period of foreign domination was very painful for China. For 150 years, foreigners dominated and oppressed the Chinese people, making them outcasts in their own land. This park, for instance, along the riverfront in Shanghai, once had a posted sign that said, this park is off limits to Chinese and dogs. A revolution in 1911 ended the oppression by foreigners and gave China back to the Chinese. But the decades of hunger, deprivation, and political corruption which followed led to a bloody civil war between the Chinese communists and the Chinese nationalist forces. Finally, on October 1, 1949, Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China. With that, the Chinese Communist Party came to power. The Chinese people who come here to Tiananmen Square in Beijing remember that date in 1949 as Liberation Day, when everyone rejoiced. But by the mid-1960s, the shouts of joy over liberation had again turned to cries of despair. The so-called Cultural Revolution began in 1966. Inaugurated by youthful Red Guards, it was a decade of chaos, violence, and repression. Well, Cultural Revolution, now we all see it's a catastrophe to the Chinese people. It's non-cultural, non-revolutionary, actually. And uh, which Christian people also suffered uh, during that period. But maybe to your surprise not, uh, that those who suffer the most are not uh, religious people. Religious people, uh, now uh, as we look back, uh, were only side ta target of attack. The main target of attack is the high government officials because they can't afford, they are careerists. They just wanted to, to seize government power you know, from them. So it's a time, a period, of trial and tempering for us. But during the Cultural Revolution period, everything had lost. They, do not, they did not, according to the law, according to the Constitution's principle. So you see, if a country, not according to their law, their Constitution, everything can happen. Dangerous things and people suffer. Well, in the Cultural Revolution, uh, all the churches were closed down in one night, and uh, we were not allowed to have any open religious activities. 
church workers were sent home or the younger ones to the factories. So I myself worked in the factory for eight years. After the death of party chairman Mao and the arrest and prosecution of the infamous Gang of Four, the reign of terror ended. Since that disastrous decade, the original constitutional right of religious freedom has been reinstated in China. Today, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, and Taoist, the whole variety of religious faiths are once again worshiping freedom. The State Council has a policy that all religious groups should have their properties restored to them. The Religious Affairs Bureau assists the church groups to resume and manage their own properties. According to what I know, there are still a small number of priests, a very small number who are still detained. They are not detained because of problem of religious belief, but because they have violated our nation's laws. If we have been able to have 500 million Chinese religious believers to unite in the effort of socialist modernization, then this by itself has been by far our most significant contribution. In recent years, the Chinese government has enacted an intense program of modernization. The goal of modernization is to improve the standard of living for Chinese citizens. The Chinese are hardworking and industrious. Everywhere one looks in China, there are people working from the small rural farms to the big city skyscrapers, Chinese people are busy modernizing their country and moving it into the 21st century. For the future, China is looking to its youth. The one-child policy makes children even more precious. Parents and teachers lavish time and attention on these future leaders and citizens of China. Such contrasts, the old farming methods and the new construction. And I think that the word about the return of religious freedom will surprise many people in the United States. Yes, but seeing and experiencing is believing. And the church in China is eager to share its story with a wider church family. Producer Nancy Schaaf lets you see and hear what Chinese Christians have to say about the current situation. I feel that's my duty uh, to, to serve the Lord, to serve the church. We are one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So we join together, worship together. And then we said one voice in our country, Jesus Christ is the Savior. The church now is uh, very flourishing now, you see. Every place you can see people uh, 
had to fall to each church, even in the countryside. There are about 8 million Christians in China today, half of them Roman Catholics and half of them Protestants. Uh, there are over 4,000 Protestant churches. Then we have tens of thousands of groups of Christians meeting in homes. The attitude of the government towards religion from 1949 to 1966, when the Kyoto Revolution began, and that of the government since 1979, are essentially the same. That is, to allow the people to adhere to the various religions, uh, to respect their religious affiliations, our government and the Communist Party of China know very well that the propagation of atheism shouldn't be given priority in their program. They put first the unification of the whole people to work together for the prosperity of the country. And in order for that unification to be possible, minority characteristics should be respected. That is the ground for their policy on religious freedom. Christianity was introduced into China by Western missionaries uh, from Europe in the early days and uh, in the 19th century, both from Europe and from North America. It's very hard for Chinese people to dissociate the religious movement of the missionary and the political movement, or even military movement, of colonialism and imperialism. Since 1950, the Chinese Christians have uh, been promoting self-government, self-support, and self-propagation. It is a movement to make the church in China Chinese. We like the Chinese people to see Christianity not as a Western thing, but as something the Chinese, any self-respecting Chinese, can embrace as his or her faith. This church was built in 1946 was used regularly until 1966. That's the Cultural Revolution. And then it was occupied by a printing house. It was reopened on the Christmas of 1980. And uh, since the reopening of this church, there have been 1,600 people who are baptized in this church. The attendance of the three services of each weekend, the total attendance is more than 5,000. I think the, the main problem today for the Church of China is uh, uh, that our church leaders, ministers are rather elder. The age gap is very serious. 
many people, many young people, they come to the church and they see the pastors are rather elder. So they see the urgent need. They should be the successors. What we can do now is to uh, uh, open seminaries uh, and to train lay people um, to help. And now we have opened 11 seminaries all around our country. They arranged the short-term training course for lay people, just to teach them how to, uh, to, to know the introduction of the Bible and how to preach, how to sing hymns. And uh, that's helpful, really. <laughs> At present, there are about 600 students under training in 11 centers. Uh, within the last two or three years, I think there must be somewhere between one and 200 uh, graduates who are now in church work. In most churches around the country, old people are the majority, but more and more young people are beginning to attend church in order to hear the gospel. Presently, they are few, but we believe that soon, even more young people in China will join the church. It's this way for us Korean minorities, especially in the city of Yanbin in northeast China. There is only one pastor in the area and he is over 70. That means we are missing a whole generation in the church. So we feel the burden of two generations is on our shoulders as seminary students. We try to express Christian themes and biblical themes uh, through Chinese art forms so that we hope uh, they can speak more directly to the Chinese heart. Most of our students feel it is a privilege to be able to receive training for their future work in the church. My uh, church, Mo'en Church, uh, once a month have communion service. But uh, those people, they are old people or they are sick in their bed. We mm, take the communion service at their home. That's our tradition. So uh, Mrs. Chen is over 90, but we still mm, remember her. This afternoon, I bring the bread and wine, have the communion service in her home. She uh, loves it. Christian faith has in it a message that speaks to the mind and to the heart of human beings living in a socialist society just as much as to those living in other societies. Socialism doesn't mean that we have to give up our Christian faith. We Chinese are also the children of our God. So God will give us his uh, special uh, light for us, uh, lead us in this new era. is a leadership gap. Is that because the seminaries were closed during the Cultural Revolution? Yes, absolutely. They're opening seminaries right now to fill that gap. 
but they're also training laypersons for leadership. For instance, they started a correspondence course on a very modest scale, but there was so much interest that now it has a syllabus that goes out regularly to 40,000 persons. Mm, well, I didn't hear anything about Methodists or Baptists or Seventh-day Adventists. Well, that's true. Ever since the 1950s, there's been no denominations in China because the church in China is what they call post-denominational. As one leader said to me, we are now more united than ever before. Meaning much has been done, but much remains to still be done. Uh, what about foreign missionaries? Do the Chinese want missionaries to assist them? Emily, the answer to that question is an, a resounding no. There is a great sense of appreciation for the past, but there's also a sense of a need to do things the Chinese way now. Well, there's more story to tell about how the Chinese Christians are reaching out to help solve some of their society's needs in health, education, and social services. For Christians around the world, the Bible is the written foundation of their faith. And so also for the Chinese Christians. Their Bible and Bible study are very important to them. Psalm 19, uh, that, that's the psalm, I, my, my favorite psalm. I think the creation of God is the everlasting one, and it, it tells the glory of God, no matter what happens. During the Cultural Revolution, when Bibles along with other great literature were banned and destroyed, Christians found other ways to hear the Word of God. When Christians met in our homes, we would try to recite passages from the Bible and put them down in our notebooks. In all these ways, the Bible began to mean much more to the Christians. Thanks to the work of a new organization in China, the Amity Foundation, Bibles are printed and distributed even more rapidly than ever to Christians throughout the country. In 1987, within the first two months of operation, the Amity Printing Press, located near Nanjing, printed over 20,000 Bibles. The Printing Press will give priority to the printing of Bibles and other Christian literatures entrusted by the church organizations. Uh, Amity Foundation uh, is initiated by uh, Chinese Christians in cooperation with non-Christians, non-believers, and even Marxist scholars, uh, aiming at the promotion of uh, projects in the field of uh, education, health, social welfare, social service, and development. One of the goals of the Amity Foundation uh, is to make uh, Christian involvement in social development as widely known as possible. That is to make our Christian presence felt. One way in which the Christian witness of Amity is felt is through their support and financial assistance to an artificial limb factory and research center located in Nanjing. There, the physically disabled are given a whole new lease on life. I lost my right leg in machine accidents in 1973. When I came to Nanjing for training in 1974, they told me how to walk again. I have been able to overcome all sorts of difficulties. The training I received here has really helped me to live independently again. We put our emphasis on children and handicapped because children are the future of the world and the handicapped is the weakest in the community. Uh, by giving them some personnel training and also some uh, equipment or some financial donations. But another project is the teachers project in education. Uh, teachers from abroad who are selected, uh, sponsored and prepared for by overseas church organizations and church-related organizations. Uh, at present, we have uh, 87 teachers 
uh, working in five provinces and one municipality, uh, mostly in the eastern part of China. But most of them are teaching more languages. So in this respect, they are helping uh, to raise the proficiency in uh, of our uh, faculties and students in the foreign languages. In the spirit of cooperation, the Amity Foundation seeks to bridge gaps between ideologies. Uh, last May, when the board met, uh, the Amity board met, one of our honorary president, he's a Marxist scholar, he made a very interesting remark. Say, he said, there is at least one thing uh, in common between a true Christian and a true Marxist, he puts true uh, in front of the Christian and Marxist, I think it's good. And that is, he said, is a spirit of service. You say, love thy neighbor, sir, to serve and not to be served. And we say, that is he say, uh, serve the people. The word amity means love virtue. And the Amity Foundation is non-governmental and non-church, but it's inspired by Christians. Amity's goals are threefold. One, to contribute to China's social development and modernization. Two, to make Christian involvement and participation in the society more widely known to the Chinese people. And three, to be a channel of resources and funds from China and other countries, people-to-people -people relationships. For example, Amity teachers come from other countries. Funds for the printing plant came from many countries, Germany, the United States, and others. If you would like more information on how you can support the work of Amity or would like more information on the church in China, write to Catch the Spirit, P.O. Box 320, Nashville, Tennessee, 37202. That's Catch the Spirit, P.O. Box 320, Nashville, Tennessee, 37202. The Spirit is alive in China and, as you've seen, deeply rooted in the faith and lives of Chinese Christians. One God, one Church. And as Bishop Ding said to me, the Chinese Church needs to be as uniquely Chinese as the American Church is American. This week, keep the Chinese Christians in your prayers. And may the God of all people and of all nations be in your life.